I'm Eric. Um, this is, so this is a bunch of, uh, I'm just going to talk about things that we've done in LeBitcoin kind of since the beginning, but also um, been doing a lot more recently in terms of making a scalable node implementation. So there's a lot more to LeBitcoin and don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to kind of quickly go through and uh, really just enumerate things that we're doing. Some of them are kind of mundane, but some of them are really different. And anybody who's ever tried to make or understand a node will scratch their heads and go, what, what the heck, how do you do that? Um, anyway, so first of all, what's scaling? Add hardware, hopefully get a linear improvement in whatever you're trying to increase. All right, more hardware, more, more performance. OK, now how do I back? There we go, got it. Hold on. There we go. OK, so uh, Amir actually started the Bitcoin. Um, who knows Amir Taki? And, all right, all right, all right. No, no, Amir's awesome. Um, those are the three uh, principles he laid out on the first po post in the Bitcoin talk about you know, what, what we were after. Uh, I fo focus your attention on the center one there, uh, the second one, scalability, Bitcoin built today for the future in mind. And so we have a definition and an objective, and I'm just going to go through the different components. Um, see if I can zoom this. That's not touch screen, is it? No? All right. Oh, there we go. Wow, this Prezi thing's cool. Uh, I'm a PowerPoint guy, and I'm trying this Prezi thing, and it's kind of freaking me out. All right, so um, the gray boxes are external dependencies that, that the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin's a set of libraries, but it also has command line implementation for Node and uh, client-side stuff. We call it the Explorer. Left side is client stacks, right side is server stack. Gray is external dependencies. They, we worked really hard to shrink those down. I don't know, William, if you remember how many, how hard it was, right? This is as small as you can possibly get and do something like we're doing um, as far as dependencies. And the dotted lines are optional. So they're only used in a very narrow set of cir circumstances. You don't even need to build them. Um, and the blue boxes are the libraries. And this is a build system repo down here. It's just for the maintainers. Uh, and you'll notice there's three libraries that are the same on both sides. Like the base library, Libitcoin, uh, network, and pro uh, protocol. Okay. So I'm just going to be talking about the server stack, the, uh, the right side. When it comes to uh, scalability, it kind of affects both. So we have a database. There's a, there's a repository called the Bitcoin database. And I apologize, but I'm going to go pretty quickly because there's a bunch of stuff here. OK, so the database is not a database uh, that you buy. It's a database that we make. Um, it's some memory map files. There's actually, uh, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, what, we, what we end up with is um, logically contiguous byte arrays. So just a big array of RAM, essentially. And it gets mapped in and off the uh, disk by the operating system's virtual memory uh, paging systems. Which is um, very efficient. Um, and the most recently accessed uh, parts of the data are generally memory resident. If you have enough memory to in store the entire chain, it will probably not all be stored in memory because some of it just won't be accessed, but um, it can be. And I, I, I test with a couple of machines, um, Windows machine and a Linux machine that are 256 gig RAM and you know, super fast, um, and it's just nice to see the whole the whole blockchain just and the and the server and indexing of the uh, payment addresses, all stored in RAM. So add more hardware, get more performance. Again, that's what we're after. Um, up until you hit the limit of you know maximum RAM performance, and then you start hitting bottlenecks in other areas. Um, it outperforms explicit cache, right? So other implementations will have a cache for this and a cache for that. And, there's all, and I'm going to go over that a little bit. There's all kinds of caches. Maintaining the cache costs money. And you don't, want to, you don't want to cache if you don't need it, and we don't need it. Um, the blockchain is a cache, right? Everybody sees the same chain. So um, it's a public cache of data, and uh, you can dump it if you want. OK, so um, there are some limitations uh, in current implementations, which I'm gonna, we're probably going to spend some time on in our v5. Our v4 is coming out you know, probably in the next few months. Um, one of these is uh, write, write flushing. In other words, you write some stuff to the RAM. Um, you got to flush it to the disk before you shut down, or you, you got a corrupt database, right? Used to be you didn't know like when the database was corrupt. You could shut down, hard shut down, and come back up on your, you know, your virtual server, and you wouldn't know. And, and now we actually know definitively. We have a re very reliable uh, knowledge of whether you've actually uh, shut down with an unflush write, like a, a hard, you know, hard power off or something. Um, but if you, uh, we also have a, a configuration option to allow you to uh, flush after every write. The problem is, if you're flushing it to disk after every write, you really slow down in like initial block download, like, it's significantly slower, maybe 5x slower. Right? Um, on the other hand, once you're fully synced, it, it's hardly noticeable. So we'll probably do some dynamic configuration there to make that a little bit more optimal for home users who might be more likely to hard shut down. For servers, though, it's pretty good. 
um, been very reliable. Okay, and then, you know, so we have the reliable detection. Okay, so we go into the next aspect of the database. It's append only. We only write to the ends of the files. We don't delete data from a file and squish it up and re, you know, refactor the file. We just write, and this is, this is, a, this is a, these are Amir's original implementation things. So um, all new objects are appended to the memory maps. There's like seven files. Um, they remain indexed indefinitely. So you, you index something by its hash, it's always there, even if it gets reorged out. Doesn't matter, it's still valid, it's just not on the strong chain, right? Um, objects have uh, metadata, so this is kind of came along in, in V3. We, we, uh, we update state on, on certain objects to reflect, say, the height that their uh, transaction's confirmed at. Um, but we don't delete state from the files, and so you're probably thinking, okay, well, that's gonna lead to a lot of bloat and fragmentation, you're gonna have to defrag this stuff, and that's gonna be an expensive operation. It actually doesn't lead to noticeable bloat at all. We run these things for months with full transact, and I'll talk to you about what we do with memory pool, but just dumping tons of data on the disk, everything that's coming at us across the chain that's valid, we put on the disk. Uh, and basically most of it gets confirmed and it has no, no real consequence, um, but the, in the amount that, that maybe is fragmented, in other words, kind of dead data that's still indexed, doesn't end up mattering. But if you want to defragment it, what do you do? It's a cache, just resync it. You can do that in two hours, so um, not too bad. And if you, have a, if you have a checkpointed store, you can obviously do it much quicker. Um, so defragmentation cost is fully deferred. We don't defrag. If you wanna, you wanna do it, you can do it, but we're not doing it dynamically, so we're not slowing down your validation and all sort of stuff. Um, okay, I think I covered, yeah, resync to defrag, and then, um, so we don't support pruning. Um, the objective is not to make non-nodes. I mean, if you're gonna be a node, you, you can't be pruning stuff. You can't, you can't support sync on other nodes. So that's not a goal, um, but uh, this, this technique wouldn't be too friendly for pruning because, you know, how do you get rid of the data if you're only appending? You'd have to, have to write some defragmenter and really hurt performance. So what's the cheapest resource you have on a computer? Hard drive. <laughs> so what do you optimize for? Not the RAM, you optimize, for, you, you optimize, I mean, not the hard drive, right? You, you don't care how big it is, really. I mean, not, not in, the, in, the, in the range as we're talking. Cheap, okay? So, um, con, all right, so now we start getting into more interesting, like, V4 stuff, uh, concurrent write. The database um, can support parallel block download and write. We can, we can write all blocks from multiple peers to the store at exactly the same time, on multiple threads. So the system can run, uh, the node can run on one thread, it's asynchronous, but it can also run on, I run on 64 threads, it's great. Um, I've run, not normally, but I've run thousands of peers as well. Um, so we have certain things that you do have to guard against, you know, if anybody's done concurrent programming, and sorry, I'm you know, talking fast, and this is kind of, this is kind of technical stuff, but um, memory allocation is, uh, memory allocation rate is configurable. So in other words, when we allocate memory to these files, we pre-allocate a big chunk, right? You can configure how, what's the, what's the ratio of that, re that reallocation. You can also just cause it to allocate the entire size of the blockchain initially and you never have to reallocate any memory. Um, so when a new object comes in, you have to reserve some memory to write that object. You know, that's just a little math. There's not even any reading or writing going on. We just lock, do some math, give you the, give you the data. So there's a lock there, uh, remap. So if the operating system decides it wants to move all the memory to somewhere else where it has more space, all the pointers become invalid, everything you're doing on all the other threads goes haywire, it's a disaster, right? We actually had this problem in earlier versions. Um, and so that's guarded. If there's, a, if there's a remap due to a reallocation, everything that's got a pointer is now either working or ends up locked until the remap occurs and then it continues. So it's safe, it rarely happens, and it's very fast, so it's kind of inconsequential. Um, metadata updates, so if you're writing data into a transaction like it's been confirmed at this height, we already wrote the transaction, now we're gonna say, oh, it's confirmed. We have to guard that because something could be reading the transaction at the same time we're writing, so there's locks there, but not during, um, not during the, the heavy load process where we're just downloading all the blocks, nothing's being written there. Um, but that's, that's, like, that's the extent of locking in the database. Everything else is, um, atomic pointer swaps. So we put an object in the database, we, we allocate some memory, we write the object to memory, uh, nothing can see it yet, it's not indexed. We, we then um, create a pointer to it, that, that, pointer, that pointer update is atomic, it's locked. Um, after that, everybody can see it and it never goes away, so we never have to worry about um, any problems with concurrency. Okay, and so there's no defrag, so every, all, all data remains valid. If you reorg a block out, the block's still there, it's just, it's just no longer, um, what we call confirmed. 
Okay, so fast, right? Um, so this is another original aspect of the database, and this has become better over time, but in theoretical terms, it's the same as it's always been. Um, we have two types of tables, uh, hash tables and arrays. Constant time, right? Technically, hash tables are constant time, best, you know, normally, and worst case, uh, linear, but what we see because of the evenness of the spread of the data, because it's all indexed by uh, hashes, by, by block and transaction hashes, and then re-indexed as 64-bit hashes, is that it's, the data spread pretty well, and depending on how you, you can configure the bucket count for each hash table, so you can, actually in our config file when you start up the first time, and you just, more buckets, less buckets, you'll have more or less collisions, and so you can kind of tune it yourself. And we did that so people could kind of help us get the optimal bucket sizes for different, different um, chains. So you have very low, like, normally the, we end up with like one and a half collisions per uh, hash, um, per entry in the hash table, which is, is pretty low and it keeps the hash table header size small. Um, but anyway, you know, you, you've, got, you've got block height indexing uh, in, in arrays, which is you know, lightning fast, constant time, and everything else is indexed by hashes, which is lightning fast. So query speed on the Bitcoin has always been faster than anything out there. Um, but what we've worked to do is really um, compact the size of the data and um, eliminate locks on the data, as we talked about before, so everything can be parallelized. So all, all read-write updates to the store are constant time. Uh, and I kind of covered everything else. OK, so linear growth. This is, um, this is pretty much the case with, with most implementations. They don't, this, the state size doesn't grow nonlinearly. Um, it does to a very small degree. Um, so what you want is you add, you add, you add more data from, from the network. You want the store to kind of grow linearly with that, right? You don't want a kind of a 2x, 3x type growth every time you add something. And so we, get, we actually do really well. Um, I, I, did some, I did some checking recently, um, synced with uh, you know, Bitcoin D on, on uh, B, uh, BTC mainnet. And uh, we were, if you don't use transaction indexing, which is an optional switch, um, you, you know, that, that sync is, their sync is much, uh, is, is faster than, than if you add their transaction in indexing, but we always index all transactions. So it's kind of not fair. Um, but if you, uh, if you look at our store, uh, it's smaller now than, than uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin D. Uh, even with full transaction indexing, which I didn't actually do in that example for them. And the server, which is a layer over our node, indexes all payments. So every single payment that occurs on, on, in Bitcoin uh, gets indexed so that you can query it um, for wallets and things like that. Uh, so Electrum X does something similar. We're actually working um, to become fully compatible with Electrum. I've been talking to Thomas V about it a little bit. Um, some of the people working on it independently. But we'll end up, I, I think, uh, pretty soon with... Um, API compatibility, and I looked uh, recently at the Electromex uh, state size, and we're actually about the same size, which is pretty good. So in other words, there's no, all this performance, uh, what I'm not showing here really is, I'm not showing, um, you know, important scale differences. I'm showing that we haven't made compromises on the store size to achieve these performance gains. We actually are doing better than, than other implementations. Um, and doesn't matter how many UTXOs are, doesn't affect our state size. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here. OK, so now we move on. That was database. This is blockchain. Everybody with me so far? Am I going too fast? Am I running out of time? I don't know. Yeah, OK. I, I'm, I'm probably going to run out of time. But um, OK, so, so blockchain is implemented in these two libraries, Libitcoin blockchain, Libitcoin consensus, which is optional. It, that's really just taking um, the uh, uh, consensus libraries from the uh, Bitcoin D implementation and making it so you can link them. But we have our own, and, and that's generally what I test with. So we have uh, these other characteristics that are, that are interesting in terms of scale, and this is where I th think it starts getting really interesting. So there's no pooling in the Bitcoin. There is no transaction memory pool. There is no block orphan pool. There's talk about caching as well, but so how do you do that? Well, we just write everything to the disk. And we validate it, write it to the disk, and uh, we, we in, in V4, we've added a, um, a DAG, uh, directed asynchronous graph of transaction metadata, so that we can rapidly generate uh, a block template. But that's only for the block template. It has nothing to do with validation. or Actually, it, 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 will, it will give us some further optimizations and validation as well. But, um, so yeah, we just save them right to the store. And so when the block comes in later and we, we've, we've got those transactions in a block, they're already validated and they're already written. 
Um, and if anybody's you know, really smart about this stuff and running, well, geez, what if there's a soft fork and the rules change and you validate them? Yeah, we deal with that, so no time to explain. Um, block orphan pool, that was really costly back in the day. I don't know, William, if you remember that. It was a nightmare, right? That's gone, right? <laughs> That's gone. Um, so we have, con we have a, similar to the uh, transaction DAG, we have a, um, a con so with a, that big O of one there, that means that anything in the DAG is indexed by hash in constant time. So even though it's a graph, if you want to find out whether we already have this transaction or we already have this block, it's constant time lookup because it's kind of a complex data structure that has a hash table creating a tree. So uh, we, have a, we have a header pool, which is prunable, kind of necessary. Um, and what that does is that maintains the, uh, the reorganization aspects of, of Bitcoin. So as block, you know, headers are coming in, we're, you know, it's header first. So header, we're, not, we're not doing this with blocks anymore. We're doing this with headers. Headers comes in. We're trying to figure out where the strong chain is. We're doing that in a, in a data structure that has nothing but about 100 bytes per, per block that we haven't written to the disk yet. As soon as you write it to the disk, it's, it's no longer in this data structure. So no transactions in memory, no blocks in memory, a small amount of headers at the tip in memory so we can do reorgs. Generally, that thing's empty. Right? There's like one as it's transitioning through. So, um, okay, so we get into um, downloading blocks. So, so that's great, right? You know, you get 250,000 blocks in the mempool and blockchain info is crashing and I go over to CanCoin, which runs a block explorer on our node, and it's just lightning fast and blazing through that. And we had a long chat about that, how, funny, how funny this was. It, just, it doesn't matter how many blocks are in the mempool because they're not in the mempool. They're in what we call a transaction pool, which is on disk which, by the way, is in memory, right? I already talked about that. So it's, you know, you get, the, you get the model right and everything works out. So we're uncached. There is no UTXO cache. There's no UTXO store. We just store the UTXOs. In, they're just part of the transactions. They're on the disk. Um, they're easy to look up because you look them up by the transaction hash, right? And then the offset. So, yeah, constant time lookup for one. There's a fixed size. So, or, you know, constant time lookup for the output. So no big deal. Lightning fast. Um, so... UTXO, as long as you're not pruning the store, the UTXO count has, is irrelevant. Um, and we don't cache signatures or script because, again, we validated the entire transaction and written it to the disk. The whole thing's cached, right? Cached. Um, unconfirmed transactions, again, so the unconfirmed transactions are immediately uh, validated and stored. Um, if consensus forks uh, are, are if we're in a transition on a consensus fork, which might happen like what, one every 100,000 blocks or so, we have to do revalidation of that small number of transactions that have, have transitioned across um, validation rules. Okay, and uh, so transaction count doesn't matter. Everything's simple, great. So those are some of the big ones. This is a little bit more esoteric. Anybody that's ever kind of worked in a node has to deal with this fact that you have to look back through block header history to do things like look at the, the, uh, the versions on the blog. Uh, yeah, you look at the versions and the, uh, the bits field so that you can do things like uh, soft fork activation, um, and uh, proof of work calculations, retargeting, et cetera, right? So th those can be very costly um, lookups. In, in testnet, you can go back you know, 2,000 blocks and read all these every time you're validating a block, right? So we don't do that. We, uh, we do this thing called uh, state propagation. We maintain chain state in a data structure that's very small and has the necessary data going back. And every time a new block gets built on the previous one, we roll the chain state forward, we propagate it forward. So we take the new data, we push the old data off the bottom of the stack, and now we've, you know, we just keep push, pushing it forward. So we never need to hit the disk. And that, that basically allows us to do validation rapidly against the transaction pool, new blocks, and any block in this tree that we're building in memory, the header tree, has chain state for itself. So any block comes on any of those branches, we immediately, we don't have to go back to the disk to find anything. So the goal is to never hit the disk, even though it's not really a disk, it's just RAM. Um, so this is really cool. This is something I'm working on right now. And this, I, this was actually proposed by one of the Electrum guys I was, I was talking to. Um, concurrent validation. So we're doing, in, in V4, we're doing con continuous concurrent or parallel block download. In other words, we get the header, we get the strong header chain, and it comes, it comes to the current time frame within, say, 24 hours, whatever is configured. And now we start downloading those blocks. So say Bitcoin mainnet, 520,000 blocks. Send them out to all your peers, all the hashes, start downloading them all in parallel. There's no box in flight, none of that complicated nonsense. We just divide them up and ask the peers to give them to us. So as they come in, we just write them to the disk. And once we've got the whole chain, you know, we, we've got the whole chain. Um, so we kind of move up the, uh, the point in the chain that's complete as we're getting them filled in. 
And if we're validating as we're doing this, you know, depending on where you have checkpoints or milestones set, we just move the validator up. So initially, that validator was moving up linearly, right? You can't validate a block until you validate its previous block. But that's not actually true. You can do the most expensive parts of the validation, in most cases, in parallel, without looking up the outputs for the inputs. So that's, that's pretty cool, right? Um, so that's what this is, concurrent. Not only will we, have, we have concurrent block validation, but we have concurrent, sorry, concurrent block download and storage, which obviously requires a parallel store where you can, you know, it can accept all the data at the same time. But we also have concurrent validation going on for the most expensive part of the validation. Okay, so uh, this stuff is going to get less interesting. So let me, um, what does this mean? Uh, I didn't have, we're not at the point where I have like really good uh, objective metrics to compare, but I can give you a feel for it. Um, so again, I have this Windows machine, a Linux machine. Um, I was able to fully sync mainnet a couple weeks ago consistently, several times, uh, you know, on my Windows machine in, in three hours. Um, on the Linux machine, it took about two hours. Um, there's differences in the, mem the, the memory map on the Windows machines and, and also the serializer that, that, that we haven't figured out what the performance issue is with them, but they, they, uh, they bring us down a little bit. Um, and those are, those are fast machines, um, but, but on the Windows machine to just compare, um, Bitcoin D took over 12 hours. And it's not validating anything, right? It's using, it's using the well-known blocks or whatever. To not, so so I wasn't, ours wasn't validating um, all the blocks either. Uh, that part is still being hooked up. But it's, it's a pretty good apples to apples comparison. And then remember, we're indexing all transactions in that case. And they're not. Once you, once you add in the transaction index switch, it becomes even much slower. So currently, you know, we're apples to apples maybe four to six times faster to do additional block download. And this is without any optimizations. This is just initially getting it working um, the way we want. So pretty cool, um, running out of time. <laughs> so the network is, is for a long time been based on Boost ASIO, Proactor. It's asynchronous, you can run on one thread, but it's, it's still asynchronous. This is the parallel, um, so you can, you, can, you can configure it to run on as many threads as you've got, physical threads as you've got, or, um, or you can just configure it to run on one if you want. Um, and the parallel block download takes advantage of that. So the more threads you've got, the more blocks you're downloading in parallel. But again, you can have thousands of peers if you want. You know, generally, we configure for eight. Uh, outgoing. And so as we're doing the parallel block download, um, you're going to get actual, you know, concurrent downloading and storage if you're running on more than one thread. Um, work is going to be divided among the peers. And so you always have this problem, like, what if I have slow peers? And that's going to really drag me down, right? So we, we, we worked out this um, way to determine what's a slow peer, right? Standard deviation. So we track the deviation of all the peers. Um, if one falls below, um, by default, I think it's one, negative 1.5 uh, deviation from the norm. We drop it, we pick up another one. You can configure that. You could make it, you know, if you didn't want to drop peers at all, you just make it, you know, two or three, and it won't drop peers. Um, so channel finishes up. It's got all of its blocks downloaded. It needs more work. It just steals work from the, from the, from the channel that's got the most peers downloaded. And then that, that peer drops because we don't want all those blocks coming in redundantly. And then it continues on. So... Uh, also, since we're, we end up dropping peers pretty frequently because they're slow, they're not responding, um, we've stolen work from them, we, we do uh, batching of connections. And this is true, this is continuous. It's not something we do during initial block downloads to suggest how the system works. So batching is, um, you can configure it by default, it, I think it's five. So every time we go to connect to a peer, we grab five addresses, we broadcast it out in, in parallel, and the first one to come back gets connected, the other get dropped. And that's because on the average, one out of every five addresses on the, in the address pool is good, so it really doesn't affect the network at all on, you know, on the average. But it makes your node run a lot faster. Um, and finally, the server. Uh, so the, serv the client server protocol is implemented in the Bitcoin protocol. That's kind of a zero MQ abstraction. And the Bitcoin server exposes um, query, a query interface over the node. So really, that's all the server is. It's, it's configured you know, zero MQ interface over the, uh, the node implementation. So you get zero MQ, which is itself uh, asynchronous protocol independent. You know, by default, the endpoints are TCP, but you can make them whatever you want. You can run in proc, out of proc, um, and uh, extremely low overhead. And it does connection management for you, uh, timeouts, and um, keep alive, things like that. Extremely efficient, fastest stuff out there. Um, and so this is kind of analogous to the JSON RPC interface, right? But this is internet scale, extremely fast. Um, so we have constant time lookup going directly to a zero MQ interface. Um, curve CP, so um, curve, curve CP is, uh, there's an implementation called Curve ZMQ, and that's um, 
Uh, that's what we use. Curve CP is kind of like the equivalent of TLS. <laughs> Who likes TLS? Um, so there's no HTTP, there's no web servers, none of that stuff. This is just an ECDH implementation over sodium. Uh, modern crypto, elliptic curve, you know, 32 byte keys, you know, in the config file, that's it. You self-generate the keys using our Bitcoin Explorer app, and that's it. You get everything you'd expect, server, server identity, um, privacy, if you enable it, and client auth if you want. Um, so you can, you know, you can just do that with your config file. Uh, workers internally to the implementation are de decoupled from the endpoints. So uh, there's a worker for every endpoint, and on the um, and on the query endpoint, which is kind of does the most complex work. It's not just pushing; it's actually responding to requests. You can configure as many threads to spin up as workers as you want. I, I've tried it. You know, I can't generate enough load to make more than one thread worthwhile. So you know, millions of requests hardly notice it. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip over this, because uh, I'm almost out of time. Um, oops, queries, right, block. So there's, there's, there's query endpoints, and then there's block, block notifier and transaction notifier, and there's a heartbeat. Um, this is the kind of one really important thing. So when you're, you're ranking a high-scale server, one of the problems you run into is your clients don't always want to accept your data, right? Or they don't want to give it to you fast enough, one or the other. So you you're end up getting throttled by your clients. Not good, right? So we use one of ZeroMQ's capabilities uh, called high water. If you're pushing data out to your clients and they're not responding, you just drop the data, right, <laughs> at some point. You have to. Um, otherwise, you're going you're gonna to fail over. And that's not what you want. You want the clients to, take, to suffer the, the cost in this, in this case. So it's absolutely necessary. And you don't see a lot of implementations of uh, you know, client server applications that do this properly. Um, you can configure the limits, so you know you want to you want to drop you start dropping messages once you've queued up a hundred thousand or a million or whatever. Right? You can do that. Um, but what we do is we provide the client a sequence number for every, everything that's droppable is sequenced. So there's a there's a there's a counter in there for the for the connection if it's query ba query based or for the broadcast for globally if it's push you know broadcast based. So a client can see if it's lost something if it hasn't gotten it and go back and get it again once it catches up. So it's perfectly reliable, um, but um, fast and doesn't, doesn't drag down your server. OK, so I used up all my question time. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Woo! OK, everybody still here? Are Fire you still hose, okay? there you go. Whoa, all right. <laughs> Woo! Zero MQ, I mean, good Lord. OK, are there, are there questions worthy of the presentation? Yes, all right, let's do it. What did you say? Uh, thank you very much, very interesting. Uh, a bit of a practical question maybe, but um, is it compatible with Bitcoin Cash or plans to do that? Yeah, it's good. I, I figured that would come up. Um, I meant to actually mention that up front, but I didn't have it in my slides, so you know, it gets lost. So um, if you, you, you go on the Bitcoin site under the server wiki, there's a server repo wiki, and it kind of, under there, there's an FAQ, and in the FAQ, it kind of got policy on um, forks, splits, alts, you know, there's all these, these things we could work on. And the policy has been, we work on BTC, stuff that's active, like we don't do soft forks before they're actually active and being used for a while. SegWit came out about three months after it was activated. And that's, that's uh, it's expressed as a resource limitation on our part, right? So, so it's, not a, it's not a political statement. But um, we've worked really hard. I, I don't know, William, if you were in, you know, around. When we, when we did testnet, we have to recompile, right? I got rid of that around the time uh, you, you were still using it, right? And uh, so it really sucked to have to recompile to just do you know, a little fork. So we, we made that configurable. So all the forks, soft forks and hard forks that are, that are you know, on BTC are in the config file. You can turn them on or off. So if you want testnet, you, you, you turn difficulty off. If you want reg test, you turn retarget off. Um, if you don't want to accept SegWit, you just turn SegWit off, right? And you don't broadcast the SegWit uh, conf um, service bits. So um, some people, you know, using, using the Bitcoin uh, recently said, hey, you know, we made, a, we made a Litecoin fork, and somebody made a, um, so CanCoin, and I think maybe Bitprim did a, did, a, did, a, did a Litecoin fork, and then I think Bitprim did a, did a Bitcoin Cash fork. And, um, and I think Feathercoin is going to build their whole thing on the Bitcoin, and they've got some pretty simple forks against uh, BTC. And there's a couple others, too. So um, what, what I've done is, is told people if they, if they implement the forks and just give us the code, right, like get a branch, it works, and everything's good, then we'll incorporate those forks as configurable forks just into the main code base. So it's not a recompile now, it's just a configuration setting change. Which, so you can do like Litecoin testnet or Bitcoin Cash testnet, right, as long as you use the same testnet rules. Um, so there's only one, there's only one um, thing I have to do or we have to do to make that 
possible and easy, and so it's probably going to ship. I've said it will ship in, in V4, which is um, all the numeric parameters, not the forks, but the the uh, the uh, genesis blocks, a big number, um, you know, the time between blocks, things like that. There's a, there's a stack of you know a list of numbers that go into a into a header file that we need to put into config, right? So once we've done that, now we can accept the code forks if they're reasonable and small. I'm not going to corrupt the whole <laughs> implementation, you know, with changes. Then yeah, it's it's uh, pretty straightforward. So that's the plan: is that we will be able to, with a single binary, on the same machine, right, fire up using a command line argument to a config file, which implements an entirely different coin in say a different directory. So if you're doing like a mobile wallet, uh, which some people are working on, you know, one binary, right? Or if you're doing testing, you don't have to recompile into reg test for your Bitcoin cash or whatever, right? So, so it's pretty cool. Um, you know, so my my idea is I want to provide a platform a stack that everybody can use, and um, and uh, the, 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 the kind of main requirement is it just doesn't drag us down into not being able to get things done because we're doing too many, you know, supporting too many things. So, sorry, long answer. I know we're out of time. Wow. Header files for whatever consensus you want. Okay. Cookie cutter blockchains. <laughs> any, any other questions? <laughs> Help me here. Somebody. Give me something. Come on, Polly. Where's Polly? Back. Oh, yeah. Polly. We're coming for you. So as uh, someone in the mobile wallet space, accessing TCP sockets really sucks on a lot of different platforms on mobile. Um, any talk between you or the Electrum guys to put in web sockets? So. OK. Good. You, did, you know, we didn't talk about this ahead of time. It's like, he's like my straight man in the audience. So one of the things that. Um, one of our users, uh, one of the companies that use their software did, is they, 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 they put a lightweight um, WebSockets implementation over the server. So th there's a zero MQ client for just about every language you can possibly imagine, even one for JavaScript. But you know, in the browser, you'd have to add a plugin. So that doesn't really, it's not, so that's the one scenario where you need something else. Plus, we wanted to be able to do an admin interface like you can do with like a router with, a, with an integrated web, web you know, presentation. So there will be in V4 a, a um, I think the, I can't remember what the, it's, a, it's like a single file web socket implementation that we're just, it's embeddable. We just put it in the source for the server, and all the endpoints are exposed through web sockets. Yay. <laughs> it was really cool when I saw that. And Ooh. so CanCoin, by the way, if you want a really high performance web front end on top of the Bitcoin, go to CanCoin. They have a Voyager, they have a, they have a thing called Voyager, which is in a block explorer. There's several block explorers built on Bitcoin, but, but and I want to, I don't want to diss any of the other ones, but this is amazing. I mean, they did it right. They, they built a, a decoupled front end, and it queries directly into the ZeroMQ interface, which goes directly into the RAM, right, of the, of the store, and it's the fastest block explorer you'll ever see. It's, it's amazing. They did a really good job with it. So if you want something like that, like, you know, for industrial use, that's what I'd recommend. And it's open source. You can grab it. Awesome question. Any other questions? Eric, I think you beat us up. All right, thank you. Give Eric a round of applause. Woo! Thank you very much.